as night begins to fall on Paris. Backstage at the broadcast ballroom, busy preparations for this evening's broadcast of the orbiting human circus of the air begin. But before we listen, there's one thing I think you ought to know. You'll remember last week, seeking forgiveness, the janitor snuck backstage to clean host John Cameron's dressing room as the last song of the evening played. And that music, and this is what I really wanted to tell you, was performed by the orbiting human circus orchestra, a rare African bird that can mimic all 47 instruments of the orchestra at once. The orchestral is something of a Parisian Bigfoot, believed only to land where orchestras are rehearsing. Many people claim to have seen them, but one has never been filmed or recorded. Yet, there one was, perched in its cage, on the stage, in full view of the entire studio audience, beautifully mimicking a waltz. With no visible strings or wires! Even the stagehands don't know how it's done. And it's that way with all the acts. With that thought, we take you back to last week in host John Cameron's dressing room, where the janitor cleans with greater and greater enthusiasm until... Look out! In his exuberance, the janitor accidentally knocks a small crate marked for Mr. Cameron's eyes only! Exclamation point! off the table. Out of it spills several tiny tomes of sheet music and some bird seed. Suddenly the door opens, and in sneaks stagehand Jacques, guiltily starting to light a cigarette. Kid, I'm supposed to throw you out on your ass. I won't tell a tissue you were smoking. You wouldn't. I won't if you let me finish cleaning. Cleaning? This place is a wreck. Look at that on the floor. Whoa, whoa. Look at that crate. Is that what the bird came in? Yeah. Hey, let me see that. Whoa, look at this. I just gotta know how this bird works. I was, I was thinking it's gotta be a robot. It's not a robot. It's this white stuff. Oh, it's not a robot. It's not a robot. Ugh. Here's paper towel. All right, so what do I got here? Suddenly, a commotion hello, out in the hall. Hello, you won't get us away. This machine, it is heavy. Oh, shit, I'm supposed to be out there helping her. And if she catches me in here, and I'm talking to you? Please, you've gotta let me finish cleaning. Okay, but you get me in trouble, I'm gonna break your legs. Meanwhile, at home, the listeners sat back and listened to this. Hi everyone, this is Christy Gressman, and on behalf of the entire Orbiting Human Circus, I'd like to welcome you to this episode and let you know that you can come visit your friends, the janitor, the narrator, and the orchestra live and walk into the world of the Orbiting Human Circus. The Orbiting Human Circus will be on tour in the US this May and June. So visit orbitinghumancircus.com slash shows to see when there will be a show near you. Tickets are on sale right now. And thanks to our sponsor, the Tribeca Film Festival. The Tribeca Film Festival begins on April 19th and runs through April 30th and features an eclectic lineup of thought-provoking talks and documentary film screenings. For more details, go to tribecafilm.com. That's tribecafilm.com. And now, please sit back and enjoy this episode. Eldred the Tap Dancing Mouse! on the formative influence of Judaism on rock and roll, we give you this 1921 recording by Cantor Moshe Leibowitz, clearly an influence on the song Surrender by popular singing group Cheap Trick, decades later. Was the smell love you? Was the love you? Was she the love you? Was men gend 
As the broadcast continues, high in the shadowy outer walls of the Eiffel Tower, far from the microphone's hearing, the sound of a single mop and a lonely silhouetted figure holding it. This of Julian, janitor at the Eiffel Tower, banned from the broadcast ballroom for his on-air interruptions. Follow him as he mops the tower's outer walls and climbs higher dangerously high, without scaling gear, ropes, or scaffolding to hold him. I don't need that stuff. I've been climbing my whole life. I gotta go. With one free hand, he scales the tower, spilling soapy water from the bucket he holds and nearly dropping the mop. Still, he goes higher, and higher, and higher, like a small animal climbing a tall tree to escape its pursuers. Much too high. My God, what's he doing? Has he no fear of heights at all? It's for the last thing I'm afraid of. Up high, you're safe. But still he climbs higher, and higher, and the higher he climbs, the calmer he becomes. Everything looks so beautiful from up here. There's not a thing that can touch you. The janitor leans back on one of the tower's utmost girders and gazes off as if lost in memory. When I was a kid, my stepfather used to be afraid of heights. I used to climb this water tower. We had this water tower. It was the tallest structure in our town, and I'd, like, climb up it, and I'd stay up there for hours. But the first time I came to Paris, I never saw anything like this. Yes, Eiffel really knew what he was doing. I mean, it was the tallest thing I'd ever seen in my life. I was, all the buildings were... I mean, I, I was ten... I ran away. To Paris? At ten? Well, I, I, I knew I had this great-grandpa, and he was a stage hypnotist. So I snuck on a train. <laughs> I went to the train station. I went under the turnstile. I, I, I went down, and nobody saw me. And I, I, I got in, under one of the trains when no one was looking, and I got under the bench seats. And I was down there um, by everyone's feet. I could see everybody's shoes. And... The train started moving. Like, nobody caught me. And uh, I didn't even know. I hadn't thought about where I was going or how I was going to eat or survive. And, and the next thing I knew, we got in Paris. And when we got in Paris, there were posters from my great-grandfather's show everywhere. <laughs> I, so I, I found the theater where he was playing, and I, I snuck backstage. Well, what happened? He took me home with him. And he lived in these wonderful apartments. Um, there was red velvet everywhere. And, and uh, there was all these famous people, like actors and actresses, like people I knew, I mean, from, from posters. And, 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 and there were always parties. Um, and my great grandpa was just handsome and, and elegant and, and oh my god. And I remember I remember some nights he even forgot to feed me. Like he didn't know he didn't know how to take care of kids, but I I didn't care. I I mean he forgot that I had to go to school. He never thought about that. Um, which was amazing. Um I I just wanted to be near him. Sounds like he was very special. There was this one time. I was in his I was in his office and I was hiding. He didn't know I was watching him. And he was sitting at his desk and he was writing. And he started he had this cigar in his mouth and he started blowing these uh, smoke rings. But he wasn't looking at them. And 
they started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and he still wasn't looking and then they slowly slowly started getting smaller and smaller and smaller and then without looking he just lifted up his left hand and he extended his finger and he snuck it right through the center of the ring and he put both of his hands in front of his face and he started puffing and when he took his hands away there was a perfect smoke polar bear just floating in the middle of the room and it was even there was even a, a polar bear shaped shadow on the carpet and it drifted up and up until it reached the ceiling I wanted to know how to do that. <laughs> I, w I want. I just wanted to stay with them. I wanted to. I wanted him to show me how to be a show person. I wanted to live like those people. Did you get to? <sighs> no. The janitor takes his bucket, looks down at the glowing lights of the city far below, and begins to mop. Meanwhile, below, in Paris, people gather round their radios. You see, there's a rumor that something unusual, something quite unprecedented, is going to happen on the orbiting human circus. It's going to happen during the feature presentation. You know the strange story that ends each episode, which all Paris waits for? What's going to happen? Well, all Paris is going to have to wait to find out. But I can show you. We zoom in on a small, enclosed space that looks a lot like the janitor's pocket. A dark, womb-like space where a small figure lies curled in a fetal position. Well, I don't know if they have fetal positions. You see, it's an insect. And what does an insect have to do with the feature presentation? Well, it must be something because backstage at the broadcast ballroom, the large tape machine which usually plays the feature presentation is still tucked away, and stagehand Jacques pays little attention to it. Hey, hey, somebody help me lift these pies onto the stage for the next act. Meanwhile, above at the tip of the Eiffel Tower, the janitor leans perilously off the side, mysteriously pauses mopping, and puts his ear to the metal girders to listen. If you put your ear up against the metal, you can hear things. The tower picks up radio signals from all over the world, depending on which girder. Here, listen. The janitor presses his ear against the girder. Or listen over here. And if you put your ear up to this girder here, listen to what you can hear. That was your Mac, the pie-eating Cossack. Yermak, ladies and gentlemen! You know how I live in the janitor's closet? There's no electricity, so I can't have a radio. I come up here for hours and listen. Yermak! And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's nearly time for our feature presentation. I gotta go! Where are you going? Down to the show, it's almost time! And so the janitor begins a frenzied climb down to the ballroom. But they won't let you in. Look! Look at this! I got it here in my pocket. It's a cricket. Julia! Julia! Come on, we gotta go. I'll explain about the cricket. Late at night, after everybody goes, I'm allowed to clean the axe cages. An important job. I was just finishing up, and, and I went to the, the new orchestra bird's cage, and it wasn't in there. You mean the orchestral, the rare African bird that can mimic all 47 instruments in the orchestra at once? The orbiting human circus is one bird band? I looked everywhere for it, and it wasn't anywhere. It was all my fault. And sometimes the lock doesn't lock. I was scared it ran away. Everyone was going to know I did it. But then I heard something in Mr. Cameron's office. You mean John Cameron, host of the Orbiting Human Circus, whose dressing room you've invaded on multiple occasions? You didn't. I had to. It was dark. I turned on the light, and there it was. The orchestral was standing right over this cricket like it was going to eat it. But it didn't. It was 
Listening. Listening? I swear to God. It looked like the cricket was telling the orchestral a story. Oh, it's through here. It's time. Listen, it's talking about me up here. Last week, ladies and gentlemen, we demonstrated the cricket song transmigrator. A machine that allows us to hear the cricket song as the cricket hears it. After the show, I discovered Julian toying with that machine, violating a great many rules. But for once, we're glad he did. The machine caught a cricket backstage in mid-anecdote. And for the first time, a cricket story was translated into the human tongue. I realized we simply had to share it with you. We discovered not only that crickets are the greatest storytellers in the world, but why they are. When a cricket is caught by a bird, he is always given a chance to tell a story. And if it's a good one, that bird will spare that cricket's life. So, let's bring out the cricket. Our janitor, ladies and gentlemen. Put him in my hand, Julia. Roll out the machine, Jacques. Little cricket, up on the platform you go. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we make radio history a cricket's own story our feature presentation, The Extraordinary Tale of Ladislaw Koskowski. <coughs> Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is we crickets who see what no one else does. But there is no mystery more beloved amongst us than that of Ladislaw Kolbskovsky. Ladislaw Kolbskovsky was a promising young clockmaker who believed due to certain incontrovertible laws of physics, clocks would run more accurately counterclockwise. And he was correct. His clocks were too accurate, in fact. Who wants to own a clock that runs a different time than all others? Nobody. He cannot afford to eat. His whole life is his shop, and his shop is failing. He had to find some way to make people want his clocks, but he finds it impossible to work. Through the ceiling of his workshop come piercing the voices of the two children who live upstairs, as if in the room with him. The children constantly beg for dolls he knows the parents cannot afford. Christmas will come. Bring disappointment. Hysterics. Ladislaw finds himself gathering small bits of fabric from his wardrobe, materials from his workshop, and beginning to fashion the children two dolls, one for the boy and one for the girl. They will be good dolls. He will ask only for peace and quiet in return. When the family open the door to reveal Ladislaw holding presents, they are stunned. Ladislaw had never been the least bit friendly to them, and yet here he is. Merry Christmas, is all he says. I, I, ask them... To keep quiet for me. And avoiding all eye contact, he dumps the packages in their hands and runs away. The baffled curiosity of even the parents cannot be contained. The packages unwrapped immediately. How much the children loved their dolls cannot be measured in words. Then, a miracle happens. Customers begin coming into Ladislav's shop. As the cricket's voice rings out, the cast and crew listen, and chief stagehand Letitia is so touched that later that night, she tells the story to her downstairs neighbor. They are like coming into his shop. All of a sudden, where are they coming from? You know, it's not like the people who used to come. You no, know, these people are, uh, they are wearing uh, stylish clothes, and more importantly, they begin buying his clock. Uh, and uh, they smile at him when they come in and they are like, oh, Ladisla, you know, you are, you are a genius and all this. Oh, and he is like, <gasps> some of them, they are very beautiful women, you know, and they see Ladisla, you know, he is like, whoa. <laughs> 
<laughs> you know what it is like when you have not been with someone for a long time and then this beautiful person come in and is like looking at you you know he is like oh my like he's uh his face is on fire you know but he's like i'm going to buy myself a new suit and i'm going to uh, buy myself like a new hat and he's going to make a difference and i'm going to go uh talk to those people i'm going to go to the party because this one girl she had invited him to this party so he's gonna go he arrived at the party, so he come to Marie's door, he knock on the door, and uh, uh, the butler open the door, and he, I, you know, I'm Lalis Lakoskowski, I've come, come to the party, and he look inside, and there's Marie, and she's like, oh, you know, like, uh, kind of a little bit, like, shocked or something, but then, oh, you know, she is very happy, and she's inviting him in, and he walk into this uh, amazing party with the champagne, you know, on the trays, and everything is, like, sparkly there. Like, it is all so beautiful, you know, the people, but also the way they laugh. It is like crystal or something. So this blush on his cheeks is just deeper and deeper, you know, like a beat or something. But it's okay. He's, like, uh, going from room to room, you know, with Marie, and she is, like, this is this room and this room and the terrace and uh, you know the terrace it smells like uh, like a whole garden is out there blooming you know in the midnight with the stars and the light and it is all so fragrant you know he come back inside and in every room he go into with Marie there is a clock of his the people are all smiling at him and you see his clock is in every room like uh, I did not know this was my home I did not know this was always where I was going and then suddenly there is something in him it is like coming up like tingling what is this feeling it is like rising and rising and rising rising what is this it is in his throat and out of his mouth and It's a sob. There is something in him, like coming up, like a like a like a boulder, gaining speed. You know, rushing toward him, and he feel it coming up through his body. And just as he come into the big grand ballroom, and he see his clock on the other side of the wall, it is like <gasps> they are laughing at me. They don't like the clock. They think it is a joke. They brought me here to make fun of me. And he cannot control the pain and the rage. It is like uh, pours out over him and through him. And it is rushing over like the whole ballroom. Like uh, like the snow just, just, you know, like, like he is like a like a doorway through which uh, winter comes rushing. And uh, he is crying on the carpet and uh, making a scene and just like uh, cannot move, like uh, frozen to the floor. They ask the butler, the butler, you know, he comes, uh, everyone's a little bit nervous, you know, because there is this uh, crying uh, a uh, clockmaker on the floor and they pick him up and uh, they kick him out because, you know, they're, they're going to clean up this mess on the carpet now. And stagehand Jacques tells it to his elderly aunt. So listen, that night he smashes all the clocks. He smashes his own prize possession. He takes, you know, his, his, his little squeaker clock, the one that goes off in the morning, and he fucking hurls it across the room. Smash. He takes his grandfather clock, he pushes it down the stairs. It tumbles, it tumbles, it tumbles, and crack at the bottom, all right? He's just chucking them everywhere. It's hitting the ceiling, you know? One of them, you know, crashes out the fucking window. It's unbelievable. Like, like this guy is so pissed off Everybody's waking up in town, you know, the neighbors, the people upstairs. He hurls one, it smacks against his fucking plumbing. You hear water coming out, it's crazy. This guy's going crazy. So then, they hear like a shuddering of the doors. Here's the thing. After all that, he never came out. And even later that night, Janitor Julian tells it to Coco elderly night watchman at the Eiffel Tower, who counts on the janitor's nightly telling of the radio show to help pass his lonely watchman's hours. They thought he was dead. Okay. And after a few weeks, kids started 
you know, saying that it was haunted, and they dare each other to go up and tap on the window oh, or, yes. or to try and get as close <laughs> to the window as they could, and, and, and then, of course, they all run off. And then suddenly there started to be these sounds. Uh -huh. um, late at night, there'd be these, these crazy sounds like knocking, uh, banging, mm. really scary sounds. I mean, it would terrify the people that were living upstairs, and all the noise would happen all night, and then in daylight it would stop and it would get quiet again. And this went on for weeks. Wow. And then one morning, the sun was rising, and the shades on the shop window just went up. There was a doll shop. No. Nobody could believe their eyes. And the window displays were amazing. And the dolls, the dolls had this thing that just makes you feel safe and, and happy and warm. Kids loved them. It became a sensation. I mean, kids just wanted to even be in the shop, and they'd, they'd press their faces up against the window, and their breath would fog it up. There were people lining up for blocks. No. And Ladislas was there right in the middle of it. He went out, and he found all the people um, that were at that party, and and he gave them dolls for free, just as gifts for their kids. And, and he found the people that used to come into his shop just to keep warm, that he used to kick out and, and yell at, and, and, and he gave them dolls for their kids and, and their their friends' kids. It got to where Ladislas was like the most famous person in Bucharest. But Ladislas' story does not end there. In fact, it doesn't end at all, but I'll get to that in a moment. As we all heard live on the air... One morning, Ladislaw Koskowski disappeared. Both he and his doll shop, gone, without a trace. All Romania wanted to know what happened to Ladislaw Koskowski. But it is not what had happened to Ladislaw Koskowski. It is what he had done. On every doll he had created, there was hidden a, a tiny catch. This catch was protected by a, a thin layer of varnish, which, lovingly handled, would wear off in, in no less than a year. The exact same amount of time it would take for a child to bond with their doll completely. Then, the first time the child would drop the doll, or place it down roughly, the catch would trigger and set into motion a mechanism that faster than the eye can see would replace the original face with another that lay hidden inside. The same face, but with a new expression. A horrific expression of hatred. Such pain, such monstrous mortal accusation. It would traumatize the child who loved it for the rest of their life. For their dolly, Turned to them now hideous with pain, Ladislaw's pain. With bitterness, Ladislaw's bitterness. With hatred, Ladislaw's hatred. To fill the dreams of the children of Bucharest with nightmares to last a lifetime. And once the faces had changed, the mechanism would lock forever. No one would know how it happened. Only the horror it produced. And so... But the story away. went no further, because though stagehand Jacques, chief stagehand Letitia, and our janitor Julian all thought it was a good story, there was one key member of our cast who did not, which will become increasingly apparent in just a moment as... Look out! The orchestral escapes its cage and lunges at the cricket who, abandoning the story, skitters off with the bird in hot pursuit and the janitor dashing madly close behind. The orchestra's gotten out of its cage! Oh my god, I didn't lock it. I didn't lock it. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Good lord, save that cricket! Good lord, he'll eat him alive! I've grown very fond of that cricket. Wait. Make the orchestral play the end music. And the orchestral does begin to play the music while chasing the cricket, while being chased by the janitor round and round in dizzying circles. And that's it for this week. Tune in next week when our safely returned cricket will continue his story.
Broadcasting from the top of the Eiffel Tower, the orbiting human circus wishes you a good night. Thank you all so much for listening, and thanks again to the Tribeca Film Festival, which kicks off on April 19th and runs through April 30th. In its 16 years, the Tribeca Film Festival has become one of the country's foremost documentary film destinations. This year's lineup includes 46 feature-length documentary films, spotlighting the best in nonfiction film with stories of artists and activists, social justice, personal conflict, politics, romance, and much more. Indulge your curious nature and immerse yourself in new worlds with Tribeca's diverse nonfiction films. For more details, go to TribecaFilm.com or download the official Tribeca Film Festival app for your mobile guide to the festival and to buy tickets. That's TribecaFilm.com for more info. And come hang out with the janitor, the orchestral, and more this spring when the Orbiting Human Circus goes on tour. Go to orbitinghumancircus.com slash shows for dates near you.